Welcome everybody, good afternoon, and welcome to our weekly class. Today we'll be continuing the discussion of the Haggadah. Last week we spoke about the questions, and not just questions, but that the whole essence of the Seder is to respond to questions. <laughs> and in doing so, that really brings the message of the Exodus very, very forcefully, as we explained last week. If I just make a statement, no matter how radical the statement is, it won't be as jolting and as inspirational and as meaningful as when there's a question and you're in the dark, like we were yesterday, or the, or the day before yesterday. In the middle of the day, all of a sudden, it got dark. That's a question. And then it gets light again. We appreciate it much more. So now we're up to the answer to the four questions that were asked. And some communities have a custom that before they start the answer, the words are vadim hayinu, we were slaves, they say, the answer is, the answer is, and we go on with the whole recitation of the Haggadah. So let's uh, go through the beginning of the answer. If you notice over here, it says, he puts the plate back on the table. The matzah should be uncovered during the saying of the Haggadah. What does this mean? Before this point, after we said the introductory paragraph, we pushed the table away. In those days, everyone had their own little table. You push the table away, or we push the matzahs away, as if to say, the Seder is over. Why do we do that? So the child should say, one second, we just started the Seder and it's already over? Oh, it's a good question. Keep on asking questions. We try to stimulate the child to ask questions. At this point, we're ready to give the answer. We say, okay, now bring the matzah back because the Haggadah should be recited over the matzah, which, which means that when we tell the story, we want the matzah to be there because the matzah is constant reminder of how we were slaves in Egypt and how we were liberated. And we go on by saying, we were slaves to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And the Lord our God took us out from there with a strong hand and an outstretched forearm. And if the Holy One, blessed be He, had not taken our ancestors from Egypt, behold, we, our children, our children's children, would be enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt. And even if we were all sages, all discerning, all elders, all knowledgeable about the Torah, it would be a commandment upon us to tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt. No matter how much we know already, we commanded to tell the story. And anyone who adds and spends extra time in telling the story of the Exodus from Egypt, behold, he is praiseworthy. This is the initial response to the question, to the four questions. Why are we doing things differently this night? And the answer, in a nutshell, is because we are commemorating and reliving, not just commemorating, but reliving the experience of the exodus from Egypt that God took us out. And it's not just that God took us out 3,300 plus years ago, but if God had not taken us out then, we would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. So there are a lot of questions that are asked on this paragraph. One question is, what does that mean? If God did not take us out of Egypt, we would still be slaves to Pharaoh? Didn't God promise Abraham that we would be slaves in a foreign land? He told him 400 years. Then at the end of 400 years, we would have to be free. Why did God have to make a special effort to stretch out his arm, as it were, to take us out of Egypt? We were sentenced, it's like someone was sentenced to prison for 10 years. 10 years come to an end, they, they go out. They could be paroled earlier, 
maybe for good behavior, but if even if there's no good behavior, if the sentence is 10 years, that's it. After 10 years, they're let out. We too, we were there for the term that we were there, and after the term was over, we, are, we were let out. We, we, we have to, would have to be let out, otherwise God would be reneging on his promise to us. So why did God have to give us a special, make a perform a special miracle, the way it's described over here, that he had to take us out with a strong hand and an outstretched forearm? Now, of course, God doesn't have a hand. He doesn't have a forearm, but it's a metaphor. It means God had to use unusual power, not conventional power, not normal power, unconventional power. Why would he have to use unconventional power? Well, in the natural order would have dictated that the Jews should have been liberated at a certain point in time. Yes? So, God, in one film, brings Jews, Jewish people <coughs> to Egypt. After that, took Jewish people from Egypt. Right. So, before make problem, after that... He solved the problem. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's right. What is the idea? What we we, what we went know, to Egypt. There was a reason why we went to Egypt. There were many different explanations. What was the purpose of being in Egypt? We didn't go to Egypt as a nation. We went there. First Joseph goes there. He was sold there as a slave. And then his brothers come. And then his father comes. And then the families come. And then the Jewish people grew from a few 70 souls to 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and 60, plus the children, the senior citizens, the women. You're talking about a few million people. So it was a gradual thing. But why did they go to Egypt? So there are many explanations. One explanation is God, when he told Abraham that his descendants will be slaves in a foreign land, that was a way of cleansing them and purifying the world. It was a purification process. Some commentaries say that the Jews were punished because of the sale of Joseph. But the main underlying reason why we were in Egypt and the slaves, this was a preparation for the Exodus, a preparation for the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. In order to get the Torah, we had to go through a refinery. We had to be refined and cleansed to, to the extent that we were ready to receive the Torah. And that that involved the whole bondage. We'll get more into it as we go on. But why do, did there have to be a miracle to get us out of Egypt? So the answer is, based on what we discussed in an earlier class, that when we left Egypt, we took some of the Egypt culture and mindset with us. That's why we mentioned at the very beginning, this is the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. That even as we were coming out of Egypt, we were taking the matzah with us. We were taking the bread of poverty, which means a mindset of golos, of exile. You can go out of exile. Someone can take you out of prison, but it doesn't mean that you're free. I know from my experiences as volunteering in, in Attica, we, over, for a span of 20 years, I saw many of the prisoners who were left Attica come back again years later. Some of them a few weeks after they were released from long sentences, and some of them took a few years. Why did they have to go back to prison? What, what happened? It's more, much more comfortable life. No, no, that's you not... There were some like that, but most of them didn't want to be there. Most of them did not want to be there. There's a, there's a small percentage that needs to be in prison because that's the only security they have in their lives. But most of them who left were there for many years and they didn't want to go back. And yet they went back very soon after, or, to, or even if it wasn't very soon. They didn't adjust the mindset. The mindset was still a prisoner's mindset. Because they were still prisoners. They, they hadn't changed. It didn't, it didn't really change them. So when we left Egypt, God, yes, took us out of Egypt. That's true. We got out. But we took some of the mentality of Egypt with us. And that got us into trouble later on as well. So while we were better off than we were before we went to Egypt, we, it did have an effect on us. It refined us sufficiently to be worthy of receiving the Torah 
at Mount Sinai, it wasn't enough to keep us out of trouble in the future. But it, the, the way our sages put it, that when we were in Egypt, we degenerated, we went downhill to the 49th level of impurity. There are 50 gates of holiness in this world and there are 50 gates of impurity corresponding to the 50 gates of holiness. The Jews in Egypt had de descended to the 49th level of impurity. And our sages tell us that if they would have stayed a little bit longer, they would have sunk to the 50th level from which there is no way of getting, getting out. There's no, there's no rehabilitation when you hit the bottom. It's like drug addicts. There's a certain point where they hit the bottom, but if it's really the bottom, they're no longer alive. They can't, they can't be rehabilitated, yes? Is that the, kind of like the, that paradigm of the 50th lowest level, is that the inverse of like, say, prophecy, which I've heard 49 is, you know, like the, the uh, uh, sabbatical years and like 50th, the 50th is, the, uh, 50th is the num 50 is the number of prophecy. So is that the inverse of that? Well, the 50, I, I mentioned the 50 of levels of holiness parallel the 50 levels of impurity. Yeah. Okay. So they, they hit the 49th level, which was the lowest you can possibly go, and there's still room to be liberated. It's salvageable. If you hit the 50th level, then it's, you're unredeemable. You can't, you can't get out. So when the Jews went to such a low level, although not all of them, the tribe of Levi did not sink that low, but everyone else did. So in order to get out, God had to use extraordinary force, not conventional power. Why? Because, to put it in, 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 a, in rabbinic and Talmudic language, God has his attribute of mercy. He has his attribute of judgment. And they're described by using different names of God. When we use the Tetragrammaton, that's the four-letter name of God, the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He, that's God in His mode of compassion and mercy. When we use the name Elohim, that's God in His judgment <coughs> status, when He's acting as a judge. And what does a judge do? A judge, an honest judge, makes sure that the law is kept and he can't deviate from the law. That's what a judge is supposed to do. That's what justice is. There's no deviation. Based on God's attribute of justice, the Jews were not ready to go out of Egypt. They should have stayed there longer. Oh, if they stayed there longer, they would never get out, but that's not, that's not the judge's fault. It's not the judge's fault that someone was, was not ready to go out of prison and they let him out earlier because if he stays longer, he'll never get out. That's, that's, he got himself into this mess. Why should the judge change anything? So God, in his mode of justice, could not let the Jews out of Egypt. They were not worthy to be liberated. They were not ready to be liberated. So what did God have to do? God had to override his attribute of justice and say, in spite of the fact that justice dictates that you stay here in Egypt, I'm going to show you, what's the word over here used? My strong hand, an outstretched forearm. Again, a metaphor, God doesn't have any arm or hand. It means God is going to use his power of compassion, which is the power to override the attribute of justice. Now we all know that the holiday that we're celebrating is called Pesach. What does Pesach mean? We all translate it in English as Passover. Now, what does Passover mean? When God was <coughs> struck the Egyptian firstborn, and every home in which there was a firstborn, the firstborn was killed, God passed over the Jewish homes. Now, what does that mean, God passed over them? God is not physical, and he doesn't have to jump over a house to, to, to not strike that house. And there's another translation of Pesach. Rashi quotes this other translation. The word Pesach means compassion, mercy. And the two, two meanings are really identical. Because what did God do? Justice said, why should the Jews be any different? Why should they be an exception? They were 
as idolatrous as the as the Egyptians. Justice says, no, you can't you can't spare them. So God passes over, he he overrides his attribute of justice with mercy, with compassion. So pa compassion is by definition passing over. If you see someone who doesn't deserve to get something, someone asks you for something and you don't don't think they deserve it, that's Logic dictates you shouldn't give it. Justice dictates you shouldn't give it. But then you have mercy, you have compassion for that person. You're passing over your attribute of justice. We all have both attributes. There's a part of us that is very rigid. Everything has to be, you have to dot your I's and cross your T's or else you're not going to get what you, what, you, what you think you're entitled to. And then there are times when you are willing to overlook certain things. That's what compassion is. So that's why the, the Haggadah says that if God had not taken us out and we would have been subjected to God's attribute of justice, we would still be slaves in Egypt. But God did something extraordinary, unconventional, to overlook our faults and took us out of Egypt. In the, in the, in the biblical book called Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, there's a description of the love between God and the Jewish people. The Song of Songs is a love song, and it's a metaphor for the love that God has for us. And there, there's a there are two phrases. In one phrase, it says, "Ani lidodi, I am to my beloved, beloved, vidodi li, and my beloved is to me." That's one verse. Another verse says, do, says the inverse, Do di li, my beloved is to me, va'ani lo, and I am to him. Now, why does the text repeat itself and just reverses the order? What's the difference between I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me, or my beloved is to me and I am to my beloved? In both sentences, God is showing his love for us and our love for him. The difference is who begins, who initiates the love process. When it comes to the month of Elul, Elul is the last month of the year before Rosh Hashanah, and the words Ani Lidodi, Bedodi Li, the initials of those four words spells Elul, we have to initiate our love for God. It's up to us to do the hard work to shape up before the new year and ask God to give us a good year and we're judged on Rosh Hashanah. Before we're judged, we try to behave and try to initiate the love that we should have to, for God. That's the month of Elul, the month of Tishrei. Those are the times of the year when you have to focus on your own initiatives. God makes it available to you. He puts you in the right place at the right time, but you have to do the hard work. Passover is the reverse. Passover is when God showed his love for us. We were not love and very, very big lovers in those days. We were down in the dumps. We were in a quagmire. We were so far from, from, from love and joy that God had to come down <coughs> unilaterally, not wait for us to show initiative, not waiting for us to show that we want to get close to him. God just plucked us out of Egypt. He overrode every argument against us not being liberated. And then we responded. So it was God who initiates the love affair, and we responded to it. Then we say that even if we were all sages, all discerning, all elders, all knowledgeable about the Torah, no matter how much we know, we have a commandment to tell the story of Passover. And then we go on to tell the story of five sages who were conducting a Seder in a place called B'nai Brak, which exists today in Israel. I don't know if it's the exact same geography, but B'nai Brak is near Tel Aviv. It's a very, very strongly religious community. A lot of 
Jewish yeshivot, schools, and synagogues. And it's known for the intense commitment to the study of Torah. Apparently, in the Talmudic era, B'nai Brak was the place where Rabbi Akiva, the great sage Rabbi Akiva, was the leading rabbi in B'nai Brak. So there's a story about a seder that was conducted in B'nai Brak. It once happened on Pesach that Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Tarfon, these five rabbis were reclining in B'nai Brak. What does he mean by reclining? At the Seder, when we eat the matzah, drink the cups of wine, we recline on our left side. It's a sign of freedom, a sign of, of uh, that we are free people and we are able to s celebrate as free people. So they were reclining in B'nai Brak and were telling the story of the Exodus from Egypt that whole night until their students came and said to them, the time of reciting the morning Shema has arrived. They didn't even realize that it had already dawn, become dawn, and was, the sun had already risen, and they were still telling the story. They had to be told by their students, it's time to recite the prayer of Shema that we say every morning and every evening. That's how engrossed they were in telling the story. Okay, so this seems to be a very simple illustration of how far we have to go. Now, these were the greatest rabbis of that time, and many of them were the greatest rabbis of generations before and after, Rabbi Akiva in particular. But nevertheless, they didn't feel, we already know the story. Why do we have to tell the story again? But they would keep on telling the story, and obviously they were, they were co giving commentary to the story and teaching the Haggadah to each other. And the fact that they did it all night is an incredible testimony to their emphasis on telling the story, how important it is to tell the story. Commentaries point out an interesting fact. There is a dispute in the Talmud up until which time, when do you have to end the Seder? When do you have to f finish the Seder, which ends by eating the Paschal lamb? That's the very last thing in the Seder. We don't have the Paschal lamb, so we eat matzah called the afikoman, the dessert, in its place. So that's the, that's the final part of the Seder. Yes, there are people singing hymns afterwards, but that's not the essential part of the Seder. When does that end? There's a, one opinion, the opinion of Rabbi Eloza ben Azaria, who says midnight. The Seder ends at midnight. There's no, if you eat the matzah after midnight, if you eat the Paschal lamb, you blew it. You have to end before midnight. And that's our custom as well today, that we try at least the first Seder to end it, not the whole Seder, just the eating of the afikoman and the drinking of the fourth cup of wine, to do it before midnight. <clears throat> Rabbi Akiva was of the opinion that you can do it all night. So it's interesting over here, Rabbi Akiva, who thinks the Seder should go all night, and the Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, who says, no, midnight, and they all continued all night, contrary to his own opinion. Why would he go against his own opinion? He felt that the Seder should only last till midnight. So one answer is, this was Bnei Brak. Bnei Brak, Rabbi Akiva, was king. He was the Rabbi of Bnei Brak. When you're in someone else's jurisdiction, he deferred to Rabbi Akiva, and he says, I don't think you have to be up all night to tell the story because midnight it's over. But because I'm with you, Rabbi Akiva, I'm gonna do it all night. That's one uh, approach. I think there's another way of explaining it. There's a, there's a law that says that when you eat the afikoman, the last piece of matzah, you're not supposed to eat anything afterwards. That's why when you eat the meal, make sure you eat enough because you're going to be hungry if you're thinking that you'll have plenty of time to eat more. No, you eat the last piece of matzah, that's it. It's the end of the Seder, you can't eat any more. You can just drink another cup of wine, the fourth cup of wine. What is the reason for that? One of the reasons is that they want you to keep the taste of the matzah or in the days of the temple when they had the Paschal lamb in your mouth even after the Seder is over. Yes? I don't, I don't, I don't, I've heard this word so many times. I don't know that I understand what it means, Paschal. 
What does past mean? <laughs> okay, that's English, supposedly. Yeah. But uh, pass, pa relating to Passover. Okay. Right. Paschal offering yes. means the, the lamb that they would have to sacrifice and partake of the meat of and eat it at the night of Pesach. What was special about it? Oh, we, because it was at that, at, at those, at, in that time, that's why it's the Paschal lamb. Like, right, you have to eat it at the night, the, at the Seder, at the Seder. That was the main part of the Seder, which we don't have now until the temple would be rebuilt. Uh, and that's the key. And the, everything else would revolve around the Paschal lamb. That was the, that was the, the, the main, the main po point of the Seder, yes. So, if I bought five boxes with matzo, I like to eat it. Can I eat it after Passover? Sure. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you. I eat matzo all year round. <laughs> oh, yeah. The only time you're not allowed to eat matzo is the, the day of Pesach, the, the, the day before Passover. Passover this year is on a, sun, on a um, Sunday night, Monday? No, it couldn't be on Monday, Monday night. So Monday, you cannot eat matzah until the Seder. That's a law. There's a cut. Sunday, you can eat it. On Sunday, you could eat. There's a custom that we don't eat matzah 30 days before Pesach to build up an appetite for it. Some people like matzah, believe it or not. Yes, I like it. <laughs> okay. A small minority, yeah. Distinct minority. Distinct minority. Oh, okay, that's true. Maybe non-Jews will buy matzah. Right. So the day of, pa but, but otherwise you can eat matzah all year round. There's nothing wrong with that. But on Passover night, you're obligated to eat matzah. And again, you're supposed to keep the taste of matzah in your mouth and not do anything to reverse that. It's going to dissipate eventually, of course, but you don't do anything. You try to keep the taste. So even Rabbi Elizabeth ben Azariah, who says the Seder has to end by midnight, he doesn't mean to say, comes midnight, you turn back into, a, what do you, what does Cinderella turn back into? <laughs> a pumpkin. You don't turn back into a pumpkin. You continue, but it's, you, you live on the fumes your car can sometimes go when there's no gas left because it's going on the fumes. Well, the, the fumes could be a positive thing. There are, there are holy fumes, positive fumes that last beyond midnight. And that's why even though he said that you have to finish eating the matzah, the, the, the paschal lamb, if, if it was in the time of the temple, which it wasn't, obviously, because they were not in Yerushalayim, which is the only place you can eat the paschal lamb. This was after the destruction of the temple. So they were eating the matzah. They had to eat before, and before midnight. That doesn't mean that it's over at midnight. It just means that the obligation to eat the matzah was over. But then you have to continue savoring the taste. And how do you savor the taste of something intellectually is by telling the story and reliving the experience. Now, it's an interesting commentary. Why was, the, why was this going on in B'nai Brak? Well, that's where Rabbi Kiva lived. But Rabbi Kiva was a student of two of the other rabbis, Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi, Rabbi Yezer, and Rabbi Yeshua were Rabbi Akiva's teachers. Wouldn't it have made sense for Rabbi Akiva to go where they lived? Why are they coming to where he's living? So I saw a very interesting answer. There was one Passover in which nobody could observe Passover at the Seder. No one could eat matzah, drink cups, four cups of wine, bitter, eat bitter herbs. They had to fast. When was that? That was the story of Purim when Queen Esther decreed that everyone should fast for three days and three nights. What were those nights? One of the nights was the night of Pesach. There was no Seder in the entire Jewish community. No one observed the Seder because this was an emergency situation they had to fast. Who caused this? Good old or bad old Haman. So they had to find a way of atoning for that eventually. Rabbi Akiva, the Talmud says that 
Haman's descendants converted to Judaism and they studied Torah in Bnei Brak. And many understand that that's a reference to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was a son of converts. And therefore, to rectify the fact that Haman caused the Jews not to observe Pesach, Rabbi Akiva, who was a descendant of Haman, was making a special celebration to rectify the past. And that's why they all came to Bnei Brak, because the, the, the central figure here was Rabbi Akiva to reverse the negative energy that was caused by Haman by not eating, by not having a Seder because of him. Another thing, and I'll conclude on, on this, there's another interesting point about these five rabbis. What is it about these five rabbis that are the common denominator of these five rabbis, besides the fact that they were all called rabbi, was the common denominator. Anyone can guess? It's not easy to guess. No, what? They were all Jewish. They were all Jewish? Yes, okay. <laughs> rabbis usually try to be Jewish. Yeah. It's, it helps. What's, what's so common about them? Great rabbis, great sages, yes, but there's something more about them. None of them should have really celebrated Passover. Right. Why? There's an argument that they should not have had a Seder. What are we celebrating at the Seder? How our ancestors were liberated from Egypt. And what was wrong of being in Egypt? They were slaves in Egypt. Who were slaves in Egypt? All the Jews, except the tribe of Levi. Okay, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua were Le Levim, were Levites. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah and Rabbi Tarfon, the other two, were Kohanim, also descendants of Levi. Their ancestors were not slaves. And Rabbi Akiva, his ancestors weren't even in Egypt. He was a, convert, his, he was a son of converts. They were... So none of these five rabbis you would argue did ha it should made, make a big deal of the Seder, of Passover, because their ancestors were not slaves. That's why the Haggadah goes out of its way to say they all made a point of celebrating, not just celebrating in a minimal way, but in a maximal way. They were up all night telling the story. I know after drinking four cups of wine, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel like being up all night. <laughs> but they, they drank the wine, and they were up all night, and they didn't even realize that it was already early morning, and they were still continuing. They could have gone on for the next few days, who knows, to teach us a very important lesson. The important lesson is that a Jew, no matter where they're from, and what their ancestors' life were li was like, all Jews are connected. This is the story of a very great, famous Mamba, Maimonides, Rambam. Beautiful letter that he wrote to a convert whose name was Ovadia. Ovadia is a biblical book written by a convert to Judaism. So I guess this convert in the 12th century was named after that convert. And this convert complained to Maimonides and he said, people are taunting me. People are saying that I cannot recite in my blessings the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because I'm not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he felt really, it felt terrible that people were, were uh, taunting him and putting him down, that he was not qualified to say those words. And Maimonides pens a whole letter where he shows that according to Jewish law, he could say the God of my fathers because he's part of the Jewish people. <coughs> and then he, Maimonides concludes by saying, while we trace ourselves to God through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you have a direct line to God. You didn't have to go through the, the development, the, the, the whole, the whole uh, transmission of of awareness of God from one generation to another until it reached you. You have a direct link. You discovered God, the God of Israel, on your own. At any rate, Maimonides makes it clear that there is no difference in this regard between someone who was in Egypt and someone who wasn't in Egypt. 
Because once you're part of the Jewish people, you have shared experiences. Even if you were physically not there and your ancestors were not physically there. That's, I think, a very powerful lesson that we learn from this, from the fact that the, these five rabbis, not even one of them had an ancestor who was a slave in Egypt. Actually, it's that I, I probably exaggerated by saying that because they could have had on their mother's side, because the, your tribe is, follows the, the, the male line, but they could have had on the maternal side, they could have had people who were, who were slaves. But at least on their paternal side, they were not connected to it, and you would think that they didn't have to. Uh, tell the story. So, so uh, even if they had to tell the story, because it's a commandment in the Torah, they didn't have to do it with such fervor and such intensity. And the answer is no. They're part of the same experience, whether literally or, or figuratively. Okay, I. I I was going to do the next paragraph, but we don't have time now. So, any questions? A very elementary question. Um, what does Haggadah mean and who wrote it? Haggadah comes from the root to tell the story. In the Torah, it says, Vihi Gadata, and you will tell Lebincha, your son. So, the Haggadah means telling the story. And who wrote it? It was initially the, the first parts of it were written in the Talmudic era, early Talmudic era. The Mishnah already contains parts of the Haggadah, and it was augmented in the next few generations. So who it's, no, it's an anonymous. We don't know any one person who wrote it. These uh, the rabbis, were they reading the Haggadah, or were they just, that's pre-Talmudic? Well, no, they already had parts of the Haggadah. There's no question about it, <coughs> because it's, cont it's recorded in the Mishnah, and the Mishnah records the things that were around generations before. Okay. So it, it, I, I don't know if anyone could pinpoint the exact date that the Haggadah was written, initial parts of the Haggadah, but then, then parts were added on later as well. Like uh, Dayenu is, is, was not an early part of the Haggadah. And then there are hymns that were added on much later. Uh, some people sing Chad uh, Gadia. Which, people, not universal? No, Chabad does not say it. No, I wrote a book on it, but I, but we don't. I don't say it on Passover. Seriously, the polychrome Haggadah? No, it has all colors, different colors for different periods. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. For someone who never got it back, it's worth about five hundred dollars now. But um, no, it, it, it comes it, it, when each editions to go back very far. Mark. Yeah, the, the, but I don't think it. No, it can pinpoint the exact year. The Haggadah, the first parts of the Haggadah were written, but it was early, early. Uh, very likely, the men of the Great Assembly were the ones who composed the initial parts of it. A lot of the Haggadah is simply quoting biblical texts that talk about the Exodus with commentary on it. Any other questions? What do you have to do to, to kosher matzah factories that makes matzah in its colors? The way you kosher an oven, you, you, you put, make it, turn it on. It's all year round, contains salt, right? Yeah. So the matzah they bake for Pesach, they have special ovens for that. I don't even think they have to kosher the ovens. They probably have ovens that are only used for Pesach. Most matzah bakeries start baking matzah for Pesach. I'm talking about the hand ones. And the machine ones, probably the same thing. The hand baking of matzah starts before Hanukkah. Some start right after Simchas Torah. They start, that's like six months before Passover. Did everyone get matzah for the Seder? We're giving out two matzah, shmur matzah to everyone. Uh, we had to bring it in a Brinks truck. <laughs> because matzah, handmade matzah is very expensive. But we're giving it out to everyone.
It's worth its weight in gold. That's right. You know, <laughs> no insurance policies, the consumer amounts that they do end up with a hold. <laughs> if you get it broken, they charge extra for the breaking of it. We did yachas before. Okay, everyone have a good day.